Welcome to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by TireRack.com, RockAuto.com, 3M, and by Die Hard. Here's your MotorWeek podcast host, John Davis. Thank you, Alec Webb, and hello, everyone. I am John Davis. Welcome to our MotorWeek Podcast 91, and joining me in Studio C at MotorWeek World Headquarters today is our producer, writer, and two-wheeling reporter, Brian Robinson. Hello, John Davis. And our road test producer, Ben Davis. Happy to be at the round table. No relation. And our writer, Patrick Lucas. I'm excited to be in the MotorWeek world. <laughs> and our Patrick is also our producer for today's show, and we've got a lot in store for you our normal lightning round Uh, we'll get to a viewer question later but first uh, a trio of cars that we have recently uh, not only had in but had plenty of seat time in and we've got a lot to say about them and let's start with the one which easily has to be the um, single most talked about car at least of the second half of this year and that's the uh, 2014 Chevrolet Corvette Stingray. And we have already had tested the Stingray earlier this year, but we just had a chance to take the Stingray to one of our favorite racetracks up at Summit Point, West Virginia, at the Summit Point Motorsports Park. And uh, we had a great time with it, and the car told us a lot about its true nature. And Ben Davis, since you were the... Uh, You and Brian Robinson were the two people that uh, were primarily involved with that. Why don't you two guys take it away? Uh, Well, I'll jump in there. uh, Like you said, we tested the vet before. This is our first time to really get it on track and ring it out. And uh, for a stock, bone stock Corvette with the Z51 package, it was pretty impressive. The engine power is is insane for a stock Corvette. Uh, I think handles great. You know, uh, when we first started out, track was a little damp, so you got plenty of options with the traction control. Uh, started out, played with through all those options, and we dried out. I dialed them down to you can turn everything off. And did uh, you use like that the the track setting? Or, yeah, 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 yeah. Eventually, uh-huh. whenever you know, after a few laps and things dried out, you know, full track with everything off. And, uh, it's hmm, amazing car. It feels. It feels a little smaller than before. It feels lighter, although it's not either one of those, but it does feel that way. Um, Play with the rev matching. Uh, We had the manual transmission, and it works good. The paddles, I still don't understand the reason that the paddles are even there. Uh, Just have it work all the time, and you don't need paddles because the paddles, the track we're on is super tight and a lot of tight turns. You're shuffling the wheel. And there were a couple times I was just hitting the paddles with my hands. Granted, I got, uh, you know, bricks for hands. hands. Yeah. Well, but. I thought once you turn, and, and this is my memory from when I drove it, so I may be wrong, but I thought once you turn the rev matching on, it stayed on until you turned it off. Correct. Until right. you bump it with your hand while you're, uh, while you're okay. in a corner, so and then you, you turn it, it off. And then yeah. basically the next time you want it, you you yeah. don't know that you don't have it. Correct. Oh, okay. But uh, it works great. I, I guess mean, you have the, what, the light on the gear indicator. It turns orange. It turns orange. Like, yeah, it's it's orange, orange, yeah. orange yeah. when it's on. And yeah. speaking of the gauge panel, a great looking display. You know, I mean, I couldn't spend a whole lot of time looking at it while I was cruising around the track, but uh, tons of information on there, and it looks like a race car in there. So, cool. The heads-up display is pretty cool. How yeah. it changes tack variations mm-hmm. in there. I was, behind, uh, I was behind the videographer while Brian was uh, doing his daredevil maneuvers in the Corvette. Um, and it sounds awesome from a spectator's mm-hmm. point of view. And we were on Shenandoah circuit, and there is a point there. And that's that's their sh- that's a short circuit, short straightaway. It's a little more than a mile, I believe. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. one of these tracks where they take all the famous corners from different tracks and try to uh, copy them. They got the bowl from mm-hmm. the Nurburgring there. They got it like a mini corkscrew. And, it's a fantastic yeah. track for uh, shooting as well. Uh, but there is this one section after a short straightaway. If you get enough speed, you can catch air. And I was right there at ground <laughs> level when he was catching air in that thing, and it looked like a poster I'd hang on my wall. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> Okay, now the one thing that folks that see this test, they'll probably come back and bite us on, is that when we did take the car to the drag strip, we were a little slower than the uh, stock numbers. Uh, The numbers according to GM, and I guess a few people have gotten it, are 3.80 to 60. We did, what, 4.2, I believe? Our drag strip is suffering right now at the moment. And, oh, go ahead. In more ways than one. It's been abandoned. Uh, No, that's – well, it doesn't have any track – it has no – the the start stop area is very slick. Yeah, because it's uh, it's a concrete start stop area. It's concrete all the way up it, for a large part of that launch pad. And they since the drag racing season's over, and yeah. there's a, it's just track compounds 
going away. So it's almost like trying to launch on a tennis court. Did or, you find, <clears> though, when you got to Summit, was did you find that the, you had plenty of traction, like coming out of a corner, or you had no problems? Well, no, I wouldn't say that. I mean, I'm asking you. Yeah. You're talking about just, no, the rear end will definitely come out on just you. Just because I mean, of the sheer power. Yeah, I mean... For sure, it were traction control will cut in if you have that on. But yeah, it's got way, it's got huge power. I mean, you really have to try to. I mean, as far as trying to manage grip, it wasn't a problem. I mean, you could get it out if you wanted to, or you just had yeah. to. You weren't fighting to keep it. Do planted. you? It's do not you like think, Viper handful, but I mean, right. it's got a ton of power. Do you think a consumer buyer can get that number? Because there are a lot of them are going to try. It all depends on how much you want to beat up your gear just to prove that you're getting a number that somebody else is getting. You know, sure. I mean, if if that's your your goal, I'm sure you could achieve it. But yeah. at some point, I'm just not going to want to beat up my clutch that much. Or no, I I'm sure there's plenty of people. Well, I'm sure there's plenty of people that are going to be out there trying to get that number, and they're going to be sitting there going but, to the uh, dealer. Uh, that's just not what the car is made for. You know, what is? You know, sum G- it up. Sum the car up from your day at the track with it. Sum it up. Um, for like I said, for a stock Corvette, I think it's pretty amazing. It's well, I don't know if it's quite a Z06 of last gen, but it's pretty darn close. Ben, and for the money, it's worth. It, it, the performance is amazing. For I wouldn't say twice the amount they're asking, but for comparable vehicles that you can get for that money, you, you're gonna blow them away all day long. Well, I think. I mean, I didn't drive it on the on the track with you guys, but to me, it drove like a far more expensive car than it was. Absolutely. You still knew it was a Corvette. You heard things like the rear end clunk when you put it in gear initially, and a couple other things that are characteristics of every Corvette I can remember. Mm-hmm. But. You know, just from sheer, sheer uh, well, in, interior quietness, uh, how the car handled, you know, ordinary roads at speed, uh, I was blown away. Just massive V8 growl yeah. and everything that Corvette is. Makes me proud Patrick. to be an yeah, American. Um, you know, <laughs> proud to be an American. Exactly. <laughs> I, you know, I haven't been here for very long, but uh, it was a hell of an introduction to the uh, Corvette world. Yeah, it, it couldn't have been any better. I guess we should move along before we spend the entire program on the Corvette. And another car that uh, certainly not in the same league, but a car that's got a lot going for it, uh, the new Mazda 3. Uh, Going to be Mazda's largest volume car uh, in this country and probably worldwide. Uh, been completely redone. It's got the full Sky Active Fuel Economy treatment. What did you guys think? I thought it, I, I've always appreciated Mazda's sporty approach to everything. I love the way that the tack is just in your face and huge to the point where the Speedo is real low in the bottom corner of that tack gauge. And I still would have liked to have had a dial, though, instead of just a number. For the Speedo? Yeah. Uh, well, that little heads-up display, uh, I had my, my doubts at first. <laughs> it looked a little gimmicky, but once you get behind the wheel and you adjust it to your eye level, yeah, it's, it it's cool. very useful. Like it's it. only in like, like the Grand Touring, though, that you get that, right? Yeah. I, I uh, mean, I didn't mind. The, I like actually having a digital sometimes. And, but they have two digitals, one there and then one on the head-up display, and no needle. It's like, oh, come on, guys. But anyway, <laughs> a minor point. I, that was really about the yeah. gist of my complaints yeah. about I the I guess car. they're saying if you want a needle, you can always buy a Honda or something. <laughs> 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 well, not a Civic anyway. But uh, I, I love the car. I think it looks great. Definitely the best looking car in the segment right now, especially yeah. in the hatchback. I mean, I know the hatchback is more than the sedan, but I don't know why you would buy the sedan over the hatchback. Uh, fun to drive. You get your choice of uh, Sky Active four cylinders. I would definitely go with the larger of the two, the 2.5. You um, didn't give up any any real mileage. It's bar- it gets, barely. It gets, yeah, barely worse mileage, but the power is uh, a lot a lot better. Mm-hmm. I tooled around all day long, got like almost 35. Wow. Yeah, um, I I like to look a lot, and actually looking at the our Mazda 6 now, it, look, mm-hmm. it looks a little bloated because the 3 just seems like the perfect proportions and size for, for what they're doing with their design now. So, uh, Roomy front seat, back seat was so-so, but uh, I, I, I can't think of a non-performance uh, five-door subcompact that we've had in that I like more or compact yeah. Yeah. compact yeah. bold statement small car small auto. car we had yeah, nice ours was the auto you can yeah. get a manual but not, not only in the sport engine. version yeah but if you get the grand that, touring and the larger engine you got to go automatic i would have liked to in try couple, the manual in comparable cars that's got to be a pretty um just getting a manual is pretty 
pretty rare these days, right? Yeah. Just being able to get a manual in a, uh, in a car like that? Or? Compacts, you can still get a manual. They're usually there in, like, the ultra base trim levels. Yeah, hmm. but, but usually that's correct. I mean, but, compacts actually probably have more manuals available yeah. than any other class of car at the moment. Good luck finding them because, yeah. like I say, usually they're in the base models. But mm -hmm. Anything else about uh, the Mazda 3? Good stuff. Get the five-door over the four-door. Slightly larger engine. Sky Active seems to work. Zoom, zoom. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, we haven't had, we haven't really driven an ultra base one. I don't know how my opinion would differ compared. To the one we had was fully maxed out, grand, grand touring, every option. So uh, it should be noted it had the E Loop system. Uh, e Loop, yes. Which is basically, a, I guess, it's the first car with the capacitor for storing energy. I know BMW has shown concepts, but I believe. I don't know that they actually made First one. First non-hybrid, anyway. That yeah. We had it has it. I didn't notice too much going on. Anything. Yeah, that would... Supposedly, that's the whole to, idea, yeah. is that it's uh, totally seamless. Yeah. Huh. And it helps in fuel economy, is, and it helps on the load off, uh, take some of the load off the yeah, engine. Yeah, did they give any... Um, I can't find any exact numbers of how much so. it helps. I can't see it really helping that much. I mean... But as they say, in their search for better fuel economy, every little bit mm -hmm. helps. Okay, let's move on to another small vehicle. This one uh, may be a little bit more controversial. We'll see. The Nissan Juke, a crossover. It's now gotten the uh, Nissan Nismo, a performance treatment. Uh, what do you think? I was not a very big fan of the Juke. I still don't know if I am <laughs> or not, but this one I Gee, like a lot why? more. No. If, yeah, <laughs> it just looks awkward. It's impractical for a crossover. There's like no room in the back seat, no room in the trunk, cargo area. Um, it's, it's really just a very small car. It's basically a jacked up car. <laughs> and uh, like it's a Subaru X90, only like uh, a modern version. Yeah. Remember that car? Oh, my, yes. But the Nismo version, I, I thought was pretty amazing, really, for the money. Uh, handled it, great. Yeah, handles great. It totally transformed the interior, all new services. Bose suede or whatever, yeah. whatever that stuff was. Yeah. I felt pretty good. Awesome. It's a handsome package on the outside, too, though. The, the way the colors played with each other and the two-toneness of it, the wheels. It did look good. I think I just drove a, uh, a non-Nismo Juke today. And uh, the, the Juke, to me, rides really rough. Uh, but the cool thing about the Nismo is you get those really bolstered seats. It takes – it's even – I mean, obviously the Nismo is a little rougher than a, a regular Juke. But the uh, the added bolster of the seats really helps a lot. I think all the Jukes should have those seats. Let's move on to um, one other vehicle. That right. that, right, well, no. oh, let me show you off. Patrick, no, no, anything? No. No. We, have, we have a lot of ground to cover because uh, this is the first podcast we've done. Uh, after uh, the uh, opening of the L.A. and Tokyo auto shows, both of oh. them going on at the same time. So <laughs> real quickly, Patrick, since you've been up to this uh, end to those two shows more than anyone else, um, people looking, uh, what impressed you so far from what you've heard from L.A. and Tokyo? Um, I guess the biggest news would be the uh, Chevy Colorado, the midsize. They're, they're trying to call it small, but it's definitely like a midsize pickups um be out this spring yeah. uh, with the uh, gmc version coming i guess at detroit the uh the it's F different it doesn't look like just a small silverado no it no, looks, it cool. looks uh, the, the like grill is kind of like a curved down kind of menacing look kind of mm -hmm. looks stanced a little uh, sporty looks cool i don't know how long it is until we get to drive it but probably uh, in the spring yeah come on Oh, uh, they finally Porsche. I guess finally uh, debuted the Macan right. production version of that. Been hearing about that thing for years, so yeah. can't wait to drive that F Type Coupe. The R, with the uh, the F Type Coupe R. Right, mm -hmm. that was a surprise. Is it coupe or a coupe? It's <laughs> coupe. I, think. I, I didn't see an accent, Mark. You said uh, you were going to drop. The, uh, <laughs> you weren't lying. Subaru showed their um, a concept for the new Legacy sedan, and even though everybody's calling it very stylish, I, I think it looks a little blocky, but it's definitely different than and more personality than what they have now. Yeah, uh, from Tokyo, this, the biggest news to me actually came uh, the day before the show when t Honda basically trotted out three new motors and said, uh, we're going to go turbo. Uh, they're going to do a turbo... Uh, Two liter uh, to replace a 2.5 normally aspirated, a 1.5 turbo, and a one liter turbo. Wow. And they're going turbo in a big way where they really haven't had a presence before, all for fuel economy, naturally. Uh, and they're also doing an eight speed uh, dual clutch transmission. 
If you can't that, beat them, join them. Boy, that's <laughs> I, I know that, but that's a huge change. Are these part them. of the Earth Dreams series yes, of engines? They are <laughs> part of the Earth Dream series of engines. I think which, the Earth is probably thanking them. At there's this been point. some mild turbo use in the Acura line lately. Yeah, there has, but it has. A, this looks like it's going to spread throughout the line. That's they didn't cool. say anything about the sixes. But uh, I wouldn't be surprised if a small six That's turbo is in there somewhere. Good news too. for tuners. Yep. Mm. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Let's move on now to our lightning round where our panelists have two minutes to debate a trending automotive topic. True. And when they hear that, uh, Nika Watkins, our lady with the bell, will do the honors and make us hush. And, Nika, what happens if we don't hush? You hit it only one, like that? Come on, let Very me see polite. a little gusto uh. there. That's more like it. <laughs> All right. The clock is running. Here's the question. The Tesla Model S has had some fire issues on and off. And by the way, that's three fires in five weeks Hot. they've had. And so much so the government has opened an investigation. The most recent incident, though, the, uh, the people are calling for the company to step up and take uh, more responsibility. Is what you've heard about these fires so far a legitimate concern? Is it freak occurrences? Should the government be investigating? How do you feel about it? Yeah, one time is a freak occurrence, not three times. I mean, I don't know the detail of every one. But well, one of them, the, one of them, the one in Mexico, the guy just crashed the car. But they've had two where they ran over debris in the road and the car caught fire it didn't go explode yeah. but it they did catch fire i mean it's it sounds like it's just as much a freak as a freak occurrence as running over debris in the road which is you know all very possible not freak and, at all. and, yeah. and, and that's not possible. freak at all to me <laughs> i think one of the um, uh, accidents they ran over uh, a tow hitch that fell off a truck i assume i don't know if it's the whole whole apparatus or just the ball yeah, by the receiver ball hitch or receiver uh seems to me like they they're talking about doing something with the air suspension to raise the car up a little bit. But, you know, it could just be that they need to put a little extra shielding under there. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, I mean, fire it, is serious. You know, fires, are, there's nothing more serious in a car than a fire, although it should be pointed out uh, that this is not something where, the like, a gas tank explodes. It's where the car starts smoldering and everybody gets away and eventually And they're consumed. saying that there was warnings through the, uh, through the vehicle's um, electronic systems and stuff. Plenty of warnings for them to get out before the fire started, but let's just assume you have two car seats back there with babies in them. You know, <laughs> yeah, they, you you want to know that the car is safe. Absolutely. Yeah, I I agree with the consensus on the table that uh, they need to Tesla needs to step up and not saying hey we're safer than everybody else, but step up and and take the responsibility, which I think they are doing, uh, and move along. Well, boy, I didn't get any any uh, any uh, ro- uh, easy treatment there. Thank you very much, Nika. Very good. I think we beat that one up enough. Let's go on now to um, a question that we get a lot uh, from viewers, especially this time of year, and that is, is the end of the year really the best time to buy a new car, and if not, when? And, Ben, I understand you've done a little extra research on this. Well, I was very intrigued by this question, too. He does so I, buy and sell an awful lot of cars. He does. I actually reached out and, to a friend of mine who is a sales manager, and he said, that although this has been the, the truth in in the past with staggered delivery of new model new models throughout the year and rebates all the time that that really isn't the end of the year isn't the best time to buy a car anymore like it used to be he said the last 3 to 4 days of every month is when they're trying to hit their retro numbers what is and, what does that mean <clears throat> a uh, retro number retro number is the number of the vehicles they sold that month last year for the dealer and the salespeople uh, for, yeah, for that uh, for the franchise, there yeah, they have all have quotas to meet. Every yeah, month. And, yeah, and you definitely don't want to come under what you sold the previous year. You want yeah. to go over that, and that would be your bonus number. So not only do you want to meet your retro numbers, but you want to add bonus numbers. And he said he's willing to lose a considerable amount of money on every car <laughs> to make sure he hits those numbers in its last three to four days. That's what I've always told people. The last week of the month, best thing to do, go in like a week before and just make some outrageous offer on a car, like 10 grand on a sticker or something, and then, you know, walk Wait. out and say, hey, call me back next week if you change your mind. That's the, probably <laughs> the know? best way to that's a, That's an <laughs> yeah. amazingly good idea. If that guy's one car from making his quota, he's, like, he's going to call you back and He's like, I know the thing. sale is a phone call away. I know the yep. guy. That's genius. That's now, the way to do it. The only uh, thing I'd add to what you guys have said is that right now at the end of the year, there's always some kind of a competition going on for the best-selling car, the best-selling truck. Well, not really truck because Ford pretty much has that sewn up. But there's a real um, 
war going on right now for the best-selling uh, car, and it's between the Toyota Camry and the Ford Fusion. And the uh, the Fusion is could very well become the best selling car of the year, and that's the first time Ford will have had that honor in many years. They used to have the Taurus as the best selling car, so they're trying to sell. You don't have to do a two minute on <laughs> bonus this <one>. bell. <laughs> they, uh, oh, she got me. Uh, so there, <laughs> there's a big race between Ford and Toyota dealers to sell Camrys and Fusions. And if you're in the market for a mid sized car, you've got a double whammy both the end of the year because they're trying to get best car, uh, best sales, and also this uh, the traditional end of the uh, month that uh, Ben was talking about. And uh, so that's it. And I think if the bell rings one more time, we're, we'll be out of here. And it's probably a good <laughs> idea to wrap up this Motor Week podcast number one, uh, 91 that is. Nika Watkins was the lady with the bell. Thank you, Nika, very much. Our audio engineer is Jim Bigwood. Our podcast creator, Bob Mixter. Our podcast pre- uh, producers, Patrick Lucas here at the table with us today. Yes. Also, thanks to <laughs> Brian Robinson <laughs> and to Ben Davis. And we are out of here. Thanks for listening to our Motor Week podcast and for watching Motor Week on PBS and Velocity. I'm John Davis. Hope you'll come back and visit us again soon. You have been listening to the podcast of Motor Week, television's original automotive magazine. Motor Week is made possible by TireRack.com, RockAuto.com, 3M, and by Die Hard. For additional information on podcasts, videos, and showtimes, visit our website at motorweek.org and watch Motor Week, television's longest-running automotive magazine series each week on your local PBS station.